Hi guys, it is, what is it? Is it April 20... 28th? April 28th already, almost in the May. Uh, Gym Therapy Inc., I'm Justin, and today we have a special guest, um, Becky Kalal Perkovich. Where are you from, Becky? I'm from Indiana, PA, but I spent the first 10 years of my life in Illinois. Okay, so, all right, yeah, so, so a little my bit. dad's side is there. And and then when they when my mom and dad divorced, then we moved here. Okay, but my mom's from here. So. Okay, so yeah. native, pretty, pretty yeah. close to it. Mm-hmm. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit today about what she's doing. And um, Becky Becky's son Jacob Kalau um, passed a handful of years ago of an overdose, and we just want to talk a little bit about about that and try to educate you and why it's important to be to be educated. Um, but first, uh, this episode brought to you by Sarah Pro of Indiana County. So if you guys need any cleanup, fire, water, damage, needs, anything like that, it's been, uh, been pretty rainy a couple, couple weeks. So lots of basements have been, been flooded. Sure. Um, but this time of year, you want to make sure you clean your vents, check, uh, behind your refrigerators, do that sort of stuff. Just as a heads up, um, this upcoming week, we have the mental health walk. It's on IRMC park. Uh, Mac Park. Oh, yeah, it's at Mac Park. Mac this Park year. This That's year. right. It'll be a little yep. bit different than It'll the change. years past. Um, but it is Thursday, and uh, just come out if you want to support any of the nonprofits in town or just want to get uh, a little idea what what everybody's doing yeah information yeah mm-hmm. can't be too educated yeah. and i think that's what we're going to try to focus on today a little bit yeah. so yeah a yeah. um, little bit of a little bit of background tell us um tell us about jacob so jacob was i i was a single parent when jacob was born and um I lived with my mom and her husband and my two younger siblings. Okay. So we were, you know, we had a very blended, if you will, kind of a unique family um, situation until Jake was about seven. And then I married and we moved into our own home. So Jacob, you know, he... He, st- he started out taking piano lessons until he realized that wasn't cool, you know, for a boy, <laughs> and then asked if he could stop that. So I was, uh, you know, I was certainly, obviously, because then Little League and basketball, um, he loved sports. I mean, he was such a fan. He knew statistics. Um, he wanted to be a um, uh sports like a like a lawyer like a oh like an agent yes, something like that yes okay. a sports agent and um but he was just you know everything hockey everything and then he, so through middle school it was basketball little league but then high school um he started playing football and pretty much played all through high school um i felt so bad his junior year it was actually um 9-11 yeah and he got hit in the ribs, cracked cracked a rib, broke a rib, and couldn't play because they were in the conference. Yeah. The, the conference that year. And um, and he was bummed. I mean, he was so bummed. But, um, ja- yeah. Jacob and I are the same age. Um, yeah. We played football against each other. I remember 9-11. We were playing Homer City that, that night. And uh, it was such a – it was like an hour-long um, – event before the game and i just remember holding my helmet across my heart for like an hour and my i thought my wrist was going to break but (laughs) yeah it was such a it was it was a it was a nice event and what a time to be alive too during during that it's i feel like it's the last time we were patriotic and the last time we all cared about when they say you remember where you were oh yeah you do Mm -hmm. because i we were at the hospital getting him x-rays yeah when we heard really yeah that's, I mean, yep, yeah, I remember. I was in uh, World Cultures class, just sitting there and didn't know what was going on. And mm-hmm. So, all right, how old were you when you had Jacob? I was 19. So you were a kid by a kid yourself. Well, and you know, the older I got, so my mother didn't want me to go through with it. And my dad wanted me to have, have the baby and give it up for adoption. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'm the oldest girl of six kids. Okay. And when my parents divorced and we moved out here, I pretty much, I mean, my mom worked two jobs for years to Mm -hmm. support us. Um, My dad didn't pay child support. He was an alcoholic. And um, I basically took care of kids, Yeah, you know. So I had that kind of instilled in me. But after I had Jake and and we're going through all these struggles and I'm learning more about, you know, mental health and, and addiction, you're exactly right. I was a child having a child. Yeah. And um, 
you know, <laughs> even after Jake passed, I went through a lot of guilt. Um, they call it um, depression um, comp or like survivor's guilt or complicated depression. No, that's not. I used it in here. It's um, there's there's a term for it. Um, but anyway, it was you know when you go through something like that, complicated grief. That's what it is. Okay. Um, when you go through something like that. You're always you're looking back, right? Like, what did I do wrong? It's mm -hmm. always about you. You know, you're you're in looking internally because you want to try and find an answer. Like, where was that? Where was that keystone moment that I could have said this and fixed exactly. everything? And exactly. You, and you because as parents, it's nature that we nurture our children. Sure. And I couldn't I couldn't do that. I didn't do that, right? And the bottom line was, he he passed away and I failed. Yeah. Was was what I it was what's, in my what's mind. Going on in your head, right? right? Yeah. And um so yes, I was young and then Jacob was seven when I married um my husband Jeff. We're now divorced. Um after Jake passed, we we divorced. But he was a police officer mm -hmm. at IUP and um was there for twenty seven years. Okay. And you know, it's it's fascinating. Not only was I not educated while Jake was struggling, but Neither was neither were a lot of other people. Yeah, and, and them included. You right? look at um, a cop, and you look at police officer. And you <clears throat> we put so much weight on them, and we expect yes. them to know so many things. You do. Um, people want to send um, like a psychologist or a social worker out with them in the field, which I don't think is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying somebody to offer an opinion. But right. um, you look at people with high authority like that: teachers, nurses, a lot of doctors don't even know how to treat. They don't. Their, they their they get very in their field. little training. Yeah. in in med school, very and and I recently <clears throat> was talking to a nurse. Um, who is working for a treatment provider or was a few years ago and asked her, just straight up asked her, how many hours of um, medical education do you get on addiction? And she's like, three, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you'd, you'd be better to go sit at AA yes. five or ten times yes. than you would be to. Exactly. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of places that we're failing, you know, society in how we can educate or could educate but I also think that having gone through this and now 10 years later, it's, it's, it really speaks to me that society or we um, do things without thinking about the consequences, sure. which is what I teach today to families, right, yeah. and kids. Um, and, then, and then we have to react. And we're like, okay, now what do we do? Yeah. Right? So that's a lot of what reality tour does. It tries to teach kids, you know, think about the next 10 minutes. You know, if you do something, what are the consequences? Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, and, and you know, I attended um, about a year ago a, a thing called the Letty Training, which is law enforcement training, something or another. But there's an organization that that is trying to... Um, get to first responders. Okay. So police, fire, you know, um, paramedics to at least give them that basic knowledge of addiction so that they are more informed. Okay. And rather, and they're, they're spread to the limit too, right? Yeah. So unfunded, untrained, you know. Yeah, overworked. Yep. Plus, they see if you're a paramedic and you go to somebody's house six times in two days to revive them you're gonna be your mindset is gonna be what's wrong with you mm -hmm. right um and why can't you get it together well you know what that's exactly what i said to my son when Just, he was struggling things like that you know why can't you grow up when are you going to grow up when are you going to start being responsible and that's because i had no idea what addiction was yeah you know and so we are implementing things in the right way is just taking so long yeah you know but we're getting there we are uh let's talk about hi hi him in sports because i feel um i feel a lot the same way whenever you're whenever you're in sports every single friday night or and if you're basketball tuesdays thursdays mm -hmm. you get hours and hours of exercise along with adrenaline weightlifting weightlifting yeah. Yeah. you get all these chemicals and 
dopamine and it seems like everybody in the community wants to say hi to you and everybody wants to talk to you and everybody yeah. wants to and then all of a sudden you know november 15th happens and you play your last game and it mm-hmm. never again right you don't you just right. it just cuts off like that and mm-hmm. i feel like I feel like a lot of young men and women that get their high from sports and then it gets swept out from under them, then turn to alcohol, drinking, chasing women, doing mm-hmm. doing that sort of mm-hmm. stuff to try to recreate those those sorts of moments. Uh, I mean, I agree because you're kind of up on this pedestal, mm-hmm. and like you're saying, you've got that adrenaline that's that's motivating you. Yeah, you know, and there's just so many factors that are pushing you and focusing you and then you get to be a senior and it's all over it's just gone yeah Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and then you're expected to just go out in the world and make something to yourself whenever you're still a child you know people always say you're 18 years old um you know why don't you have it figured out like in four years you're going to be in your 20s like well four years ago i was 14 yeah, <laughs> and why yes. I have to I had to yes. ask to use the bathroom, you know, right, like right. But it's like go forth and yep. t- you take a talk about college loans, whatever you want. But I I have a um, a person in my life. She just said to me, I just refinanced my college loans and I got them down to twelve hundred dollars a month. Oh my god, it, it's absolutely disgusting. Yeah. What what? Yeah, yeah. Well, and and <laughs> so we don't need to go down this. I know, but rabbit yeah. hole, but. <laughs> But, you know, you talk about the big companies that, you know, the CEOs are making all the money. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's what a lot of people don't understand with the college loan forgiveness, because there's a lot of companies out there that that just took advantage of student loans. Oh, yeah. You know, with financing and stuff. And and the forgiveness that these folks are getting is the fact that there's... (laughs) You know, that's why they're, yeah. they paid so much interest. Yeah. Um, you pay years and years and years and yeah. don't even crack the interest. Maybe Absolutely. I don't have the answer. Maybe it's not forgive them, but at least forgive the interest or something. Something. I, I, I don't, exactly. I don't know. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and and I think they're getting a better hold on that. But again, you know, if, if we're not putting, some, uh, putting a measure in place to prevent those kinds of um, and I'm going to use the word corruption. It is corruption, right? yeah. Um, then people people are being hurt by that. Sure. And and we can't. I mean, as a society, why are we doing that? I, and I people just anytime somebody offers to help, there's always this other side that says, "Why would you help them when you didn't help me?" It's like yes. just because you had to suffer doesn't mean other people have to suffer. Right. Yeah. You know? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, all right, let's reel it back in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So you said uh, you believe Jacob uh, began drinking in high school. Um, how old do you think he was when he started? You know, I know he was drinking in high school because okay. we, we had a few incidences where, you know, I found that out. Um, but I will say this. I mean, my family is, um, I mean, we all drank, drink, drink. Um, there are people in my family that have issues and others not. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was always there at family gatherings. Um, it wasn't something that we looked at being a problem. So it was there, mm-hmm. right? Um, Jeff, my ex-husband, he always had beer in the fridge, alcohol, you know, at, for, for a long time, a beer meister in the dining room. Okay. So, I mean, it was there. Did he partake in it? I don't know. I don't know that. Um, but here's something interesting, and I might be going off track ahead of time here, but when Jacob met his half-brother and sister nine months before he died, that, for the first oh, time, okay. for the first time, I didn't, right. I didn't get, let you know that, um, we were down in Virginia, and he and his half-brother were standing outside, Dennis was having a cigarette, and, and they were talking about closing their eyes at night. And they're and they they couldn't stop their mind, right? Sure. Their mind was um, couldn't wouldn't slow down. And Jacob said to me, "Mom, do you remember me asking you to if I could watch TV, um, you know, go to go to sleep with my TV on?" And I would say, "Well, yeah, Jake, but it was a school night. Yeah, you know, you can do that." And he's like, "Yeah, but I, my mind wouldn't stop." So that didn't leave an impression on me until I started learning more about mental health and you know, and, and different conditions that people have. I look back on that and say to myself, could it have been something, yeah. right? And and I'll never know with Jacob, but 
that's also the reason why I continue to educate myself because the human mind is fascinating and behaviors are fascinating and society is fascinating and you put that all together and it's 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 huge. I heard a guy talking one time. He said that his first addiction was his imagination. And I, it, right? Kind of hit me just like that. He said that he, when he was a kid, he would escape via imagination. Books, writing, reading, all that kind of stuff. Jacob had an imaginary friend yeah. at two and three years old, Mr. Cowboy. <laughs> he would go to the window oh, I love it. in the living room and look out the window and talk to Mr. Cowboy. Yeah. It's like you're, it, even at such a young age, you're mm-hmm. looking for that escape. You're looking for that alternate reality. And so when they say that, that addiction is biopsychosocial, right there is probably a biological element Mm -hmm. because there's addiction on my side there's addiction on his biological father's side yeah and you know so again yeah you know these things go through my mind with question marks and i'm like okay i that just drives me to want to learn more that's good Yeah, yeah yeah um that um people born with an old soul is i think it's all biological because you you don't just come out of the womb experiencing trauma like you're you're just you know they're now talking about the chemicals um when a woman is pregnant and carrying a child Mm -hmm. like if she's under a lot of stress those chemicals are also being secreted into the unborn child in the womb so again i mean i've heard and read articles where they say we don't know half of what the human brain does or oh i know it's phenomenal i I, I that's I'm so interested in, in the human brain and how it works because mm-hmm. there's just so much it's like the ocean you we've cracked yeah. like 10% of it yeah yeah exactly exactly all right so um <clears throat> Jake uh, graduated from high school in 2002 mm-hmm. so between 2002 and 2012 you said he was in rehab four times well you know because Jeff w- worked at IUP he was a police officer at IUP at that time And because Jeff started when he did, they had, uh, Jake had free tuition. All he had to do was pay for books. Yeah. And um, he flunked one semester and then another semester. And they're like, you know what? You got to get out of here. And it was due to partying, right? Partying, over partying and not, you know, doing what he needed to do with his courses. And so, yeah, through those 10 years... Um, it was in and out of rehab four times. Um, when he got kicked out of IUP, I said, what are you going to do? Yeah. You got to do something. Well, a lot of my family is military. And I mean, we've got a lot of military in my family. And so I said, you know, pick a branch. Yeah. You got to do something. And I can remember going with him one time. Most of it he did on his own. But I can remember going with him one time to the reserve office. And I, re- I can remember sharing sharing with the recruiter that, you know, he got kicked out of school, he's partying too much. And that recruiter said to me, the the military isn't going to fix that. Yeah. And that, and it, and it was like, it caught me off guard, but I kind of, I think, again, I'm the mom who's got a kid that needs structure or something. So what better place? Yeah. Yeah. And when he said that, I thought to myself, well, what he's doing here isn't working. So, you know, it was almost like, well, I've got to try something, yeah, right. right? Or he's got to try something. And I, and again, so much of what I recall from those years emanates with me today mm-hmm. because of what I've learned. Yeah. And so, I, and so I get it now. Like that recruiter was absolutely correct because if you've got a problem, the military isn't going to fix it. No. May, may, but it also may not, right? So um, so he chose the Navy. But again, Justin, what was fascinating is he spent, he signed up for eight years and put in his two years of, um, you know, boot camp and then the schooling. He did great. I have awards at home, you know, medals that he got for shooting like on the shooting range and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, he did so well. And when he graduated from all of that and came home, everything started over again. It sounds like he needed that structure. Like, Mm -hmm. I I know 
it, it did car sales for a long time. And whenever you have to dig up and find your customers, it, some people just don't do it because they're, I, I want to call it lazy, but it, it's not. They just can't do it. But when you put a customer in front of them, you yeah. put a customer in front of those salespeople, they're the perfect salesperson. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's like when you have that structure, when you have all this work coming to you, you can accomplish it. But if you have to go out and free think and do right. that stuff on your own, you just get scattered and lost. Exactly. Yeah. And I actually struggle with that myself. Yeah. Because it's like I have too many things going on in my head and, I, and I'm and i not always able to like organize them. Yeah. It's like, right. let's, and then you're like, I, let, why don't we just escape? Why don't we just nap, mm-hmm. drink? smoke a cigarette whatever just mm-hmm. to get a just to get away from that stuff. right right yeah. like get up and walk away from it yeah. maybe when you come back it'll be that's better. The, i was gonna you call know? that the crossword puzzle whenever you're yes. looking at it for so long and yes. then you get away and come back yeah and how often you hear that you know that's suggested when mm-hmm. you get frustrated writing a paper or something get up walk away from it for a little bit and then sure come back, and then come right? back but yeah i think you know and i don't know if that's adhd or what it is but there's definitely an attention deficit of some kind right there yeah um, so he came back and, you know, it was like this roller coaster of in and out of rehab. He would come home from rehab and, um, be good for, usually it was nine months. It was kind of weird. Okay. What was his drug of choice? Heroin. Okay. It started with alcohol, obviously. Um, and again, I don't know everything that he would have taken, you know, over the years, but heroin was, um, so... Something that I learned about seven years after, no, it was about five years after he passed away, um, a message from his Navy buddy. He reached out to me on Facebook and said, you know, I've, I've been wanting to share this with you and I didn't know if I should or not. Did you know that Jake was prescribed pain pills in the Navy? And I said, absolutely not. I didn't. Mm-hmm. So he's like, I don't know if that played a part in it, um, but I just wanted you to know that. And, you know, that makes sense. You're in a structured environment. You can't always go out and drink with the buddies yep. and calm that mind. Did he know that, that pain pills would do that for him? I don't know. What what scares me about pain pills is you can have back surgery and get mm-hmm. prescribed something like a 30 milligram uh, oxycut, whatever they are now. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And you can take three of those a day for 90 days and on your 91st day you go through a little bit of withdrawal and then you're fine or you can get a toothache get prescribed five milligrams and two years later you're doing heroin so in my case personally yeah. i can't even take an oral pain med it okay. comes right back up oh yeah good for yep. you <laughs> right yeah, yeah and i didn't learn this until recently yeah because i had an issue and i was in and out of the er and we went through four different kinds of pain pills and they all kept coming up. I couldn't, there was no way I could keep them down. Yeah. But that's me. And I use that example a lot because, you know, we're so will, we're so quick to judge people, mm-hmm. but yet we forget of, you know, the individual characteristics of a person. Mm-hmm. And when I do the reality tour, that's one of the first things I say. Why is it that as we look around the room and we can see tall people, short people, people with blonde hair, people with black hair, we can see everybody's differences on the outside, but we forget that we're different on the inside. Yeah. People are born differently and different levels of dopamine and, and whatever in their brains. You know, we are not all born the same. Yeah. So when we try to put people into a cookie cutter um you know, mindset that we can't do that because everybody is so different and we have to be able to treat the individual um, for their ailments. Sure. Right? Yeah. Um, So getting back to the Navy thing. So when about this time, and I don't know if this is what sparked the message to me on Facebook or not, but this was when Purdue Pharma was being um, starting to be held accountable with the lawsuits. Yeah. And I wrote to the Navy requesting his medical records. And um, after nine, ten months, I finally got them. But they were all blacked out. Like yeah. certain areas were blacked out. Like they weren't they weren't giving me the information that I really was looking for. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I get that. Right. It was all about keeping that 
that stuff hidden. Um, but when he came back to Indiana in those 10 years, that was when the pendulum was swinging from, okay, the streets are flooded with pain pills mm -hmm. to, okay, now we're implementing the um, prescription drug monitoring systems and we're, we're trying to put a lid on how many are being prescribed. Yeah. People couldn't afford the, you know, oxys were a dollar a milligram. Yeah. So an 80 oxy was 80 bucks. So Purdue Pharma, um, they said that these meds were for moderate pain instead of severe pain. And they also said they weren't addictive. Yes, they said they weren't addictive. And the, the way they manipulated that was if there's a graph that shows where they spikes and where they where they lower, they only showed this much of the graph, like a couple whatever it, yeah. it, of the graph. So it made it look like when you're looking at it, you're looking at real information, but it's it's not telling you the whole story. Yeah. So they get black black labeled which mm -hmm. is the worst thing that can happen to a to appeal is they get black labeled right and their slap on the wrist was where will we will halt production of a 160 milligram pill mm -hmm. and that's all that's it so they didn't have to do anything other than not put out a pill that would could kill somebody by taking one right yeah mm -hmm. that was their that was their punishment right and again you know, going back to that, <clears throat> we allow things to happen in this country and we don't think of the repercussions. Mm -hmm. And then we go, oh, crap. Yeah. You know, now we have to try and fix this. Mm -hmm. So so the they're putting, you know, more um, stricter um, dispense amounts on prescriptions. And that caused the shift to heroin, street heroin, it because it was cheaper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that, you know, that all happened to Jake in a matter of 10 years. And um, he had, you know, I was so proud of him. He had, uh, but I, this is something I like to share too. He was on the, the living room couch waiting to be picked up to go to rehab out east. And I said, Jake, you can't come home anymore. And, you know, I was just at this point, I didn't even know what I was saying other than I can't take this anymore. Yeah. And um, he just kind of looked at me like, oh, my gosh, you know, something just hit me in the face. And I, I remember saying, I can't do this anymore. And so when he got out there, he did he did well from rehab. He went into a three quarter house. And then um, there was a guy in there, the three-quarter house with him, and they decided they were going to leave and go to the apartment, right, where his girlfriend was, this, this other guy's girlfriend was, and they lived together for a while. And then the couple moved out. So Jake was there by himself. He got a job at Planet Fitness, Okay. worked full-time for over a year, wrote IUP a letter asking if he could be... Um, Reinstated. Reinstated. And they said yes, pretty much on a probationary le level. But he did great for like a year and a half. And then, in fact, um, when he passed, I had a couple letters from a couple of his professors um, that, that they sent. But um, then we met his half-brother and sister. And here's, here's something interesting. I had two dreams one night. One was... That his biological father, who he wouldn't remember because the last time he saw him, he was about three three years old, okay. came knocking at my door and said, where's Jacob? And I said, well, he's not here. You know, I'd like to see Jacob. Where is he? He's not here. He's out east. He lives out east. And then the second dream was one where, you know how you're, you're in that dream and you wake up and you try to remember it and you can't? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like the farther you get away from it, yes. the less you remember it, too. So. Yes. Yeah. And so I call it, it was like the fall of 2011 and I called Jake and said um, you know have you ever thought you might be interested in meeting your half brother and sister he knew about them from from being young but we stopped talking about it so I think he forgot about them okay you know and I said I can help you find them because I, I, I got started to think what if this is something that's missing in his life that maybe he needs right so I reached out to him and said, you know, do you have any interest in, in meeting them? I can, I can help you find them. And he said, yeah, Mom, I didn't do anything wrong. I said, yeah, you know, you're right. You didn't. They're, they're probably going to accept you, but they may very well not accept me, right? 
so anyway, we went through all of this, finding them, and um, and he so he got to meet them. So it was we we were down in March in uh, over Memorial Day and then over Labor Day and coming home um, that September. He I dropped him off and his girlfriend picked him up in um, Williamsport or not Williamsport um, Wilkesbury. And he picked up his financial aid check <clears throat> on his way home. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't two days later that <clears throat> he had put a pretty good amount of it in a savings um, savings account. But with the rest of it, he had bought um, heroin, which was actually mixed with cocaine. They call that a speedball. Yeah. And that's what he used, and, and that's what killed him. Um, but... I thought that it was kind of like this all at once, he relapsed thing mm -hmm. until the coroner, or not the, the, well, yeah, the coroner told me that he had found needle marks between Jake's toes. So he'd been using so them for a little bit. Something, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, a lot of people that, that quit doing drugs, uh, they'll stop doing drugs and they're using, you know, um, like they're inching back in. They're inching back <clears throat> in, but they don't. They don't know. They start using the max amount that they quit whenever they were doing that, and that's what what kills people. A instead, lot of times. Of, instead of doing like eighty percent of it, instead of starting out at twenty percent and increasing them, they just go back to that eighty percent mm -hmm. mark, and that's what. And their tolerance happens. is down. It's gone, and it, that's like, what your yep. brain still craves it, but your body can't function with it. Yeah. So. Exactly. All right. Um, let's take a quick break, and then we'll be back on the other side. Oh, sorry, Trace. I stepped on you, bum. <laughs> Are we going all over the place or no? No, that's perfect. Yep. Oh, good. I feel like I'm not looking at the camera. I'm enough. not either. Don't worry. Okay, good. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. All right. Uh, the only reason I look at it is just to make sure that red thing's on the top. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Cool. That it's recording. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we're back. So, let's talk about um, Jake's discharge from the military. So that's that's really very interesting because I so when Jay came back to Pennsylvania after his initial two year two years of service, he would have been um, expected to do his two weeks in the summer and his one weekend a month of um, you know to fulfill his his um, agreement and that didn't happen. So in my mind. In my mind, and, and although I never saw any paperwork or anything, I figured it was a dishonorable discharge. Okay. Okay? Um, again, I had parents, you know, and, and, and family that, that's in the military, and I knew. You don't fulfill that requirement. You know, that's what happens. So, it wasn't... So, I'm planning Jake's funeral, and... Well, let's back up a little bit. He was in school at IUP out east online he was going to school online and he's talking about going to the va and and again justin i'm like how do you go to the va if it you get didn't out? but it didn't yeah it didn't register mm -hmm. right and so but he he would talk about going to the va and so when i'm planning jake's funeral i the the um funeral director says well you've got a bronze plate here for his headstone there will be a 21 gun salute and we will present you with an american flag and i was like oh that's so nice mm -hmm. right again i mean i was i was out of it and it wasn't until we had cleaned out his apartment and and i was going through papers and this was probably i don't know even maybe two years later okay right and I come across his DD, whatever it's called, the DD-114 or whatever, his discharge papers. Mm -hmm. And it says general discharge. And I was like, that doesn't even make sense. And then I'm like, oh, that's why he got all that stuff. And yeah. I'm like, okay, what's the difference between a dishonorable discharge and a general discharge? And so I did, did a little bit more digging. And here's the only thing that I could come up with is that he knew that by being prescribed the opiates in the Navy, that that's what started his downward spiral with addiction. 
Okay. And he must have taken that to the VA and said, listen, I have this problem because of this. And again, this is all speculation on my part sure, sure. because I'll never know, right, mm-hmm. exactly what happened. But that's the only thing I can think of that would, you know, that would make it tur- turn that situation out like that. And the fact that when I asked for the records, a lot of, you know, any of the prescribing or, I mean, there was so much black on this. They, they sent me two CDs. It's unbelievable, yeah. And it was all, there was so many blacked out areas. So, you know, again, somehow Jake knew to do that. I would never have known to do that, right? But he, this kid was smart. Yeah. I mean, he was smart. He, he did his research. He... Um, you know, I didn't help him with a lot in life. He he got in school by himself. He, you know, so that's the only thing that I can that I can figure is is what happened. Um, it, it seems like a lot of people that are highly intelligent like that struggle struggle with this stuff. It's like they they know something. They just know something's lingering in the background. Yes. I don't. It's such such a wild thing for. It's almost like you could tell people just dumb it down a little bit just be mm-hmm. <laughs> live life a little simpler than what th- well and jake was always quick to say okay mom let's talk about this do you ever think about this do you ever think about this mm-hmm. i mean and i would be like no never had a reason to yeah but he was that deep thinker mm-hmm. he was also very sensitive i can remember driving down philadelphia street when he was about 16 and i you know i wasn't being critical but i happened to to look to the side of the road, and there was this heavy set person. And I said, look, Jake, how heavy that, that gal is. And he said, Mom, you have no idea what she's going through. Mm-hmm. She may not be able to help that. And I said, well, I wasn't being mean. I was just making a comment. Sure. He said, no, you shouldn't do that. Yeah. So here's, you know, his friends meant the world to him. Yeah, as a 16-year-old, yes. usually that's the time yes. when you make... Um, he loved his family. Um, they loved him. You know, but he was just this sensitive person that just cared. And and even after he passed away, the stories and the messages that I would get about things that he had done when he was living for people, with people, um, treating them kind, you know, um, he just he left he left a lot of marks on people, Mm -hmm. you know, good stuff. So um, and 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 a mom needs those stories sure you know so you put all of this together and you're and i you know my complicated grief was it was tough i i mean i i actually picked up and moved to virginia where his family his biological father lives for six months and i don't know if i was trying to run away from things or what but i didn't go back to my job i had a career in food service that i loved and you know i just i felt like a failure and I think a lot of people don't realize what a mom goes through. You know, grief is grief, but your relationship with that person is what you're grieving. So a mother to a son, a mother to a daughter, a dad to a son, a dad to a daughter, a sibling, you know, whatever the case may be, it's your relationship with that person that you're, you're grieving. Yeah, and what more powerful relationship than a parent to a child? Yeah, well, they say that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So again, I felt like a failure, and I couldn't. I couldn't pick myself up. I can remember my mom saying, "You need to just get out of bed, put your feet on the floor, and go." And my words to her were, "I can't. Mm-hmm. I, I can't." And so, um, so it was a tough time. And and even um, there's a national grief group called um, Grasp which stands for Grief Recovery After Substance Passing. So this is specifically people that that use substances. And I can remember learning about that group, following them on Facebook, and reading the comments from the people on that page and thinking to myself, I don't really want to interact here, but I'm normal. I'm not crazy here yeah right and it and it was almost validating the feelings that i was having and um it wasn't until philip seymour hoffman passed away that 
I was sitting in the living room with, with my husband at the time and knowing that he had just retired from IUP, one of the gals that worked as a police officer at IUP was now working for the Drug and Alcohol Commission. And um, I said, I, I saw this. And, and the story behind Philip Seymour Hoffman is that he relapsed after 20 odd years. 23. Yeah. 23 years. And so is that the true story? I don't know. But that's that was the report, right, when the day he died. Yeah. He may have relapsed and kind of moved into that. But all I knew was that he had been sober for all those years. And then all of a sudden, he was in it again, right? And he overdosed. And yeah. So that was so intriguing to me that I, 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 I said to my husband, I said, that's crazy. I said, I can't sit here anymore. I need to get, I need to learn more about what this is all about. Yeah. And that was my light bulb day the, when I, done. yeah, that yeah. I kind of went, I, I need to learn. And so that's what started my journey in not only educating myself, but getting involved and um, being becoming an advocate and just learning, you know. Yeah, Philip Seymour Hoffman was was interesting because he, at 22 years old, he quit quit doing drugs. And for context, if you guys don't know, he was in The Hunger Games. He was in uh, Son of a Woman, Twister. But his most famous was uh, Capote, where he won an Academy Award and a Golden Globe mm -hmm. Globe for it, where he was the uh, American writer Truman Capote, who actually also died of complications with al of alcohol yeah. and, and drugs. Yeah. I thought that was... Mm -hmm. um, for me, that there was a celebrity, and you guys, no one even knows who he is. His name was Harrison Whittles. He was a writer for um, Parks and Rec, the TV show Parks and Recreation. And I just... Here you are, like, where you want to be in life. You're, you finally, you're like a dog chasing a car. You finally caught it. Mm -hmm. And he's writing on a syndicated television show, you know, doing doing what he wants to. And then after a day's work, he's like going to buy heroin under a bridge from somebody. Yeah. So it's it, it doesn't matter who you are. This stuff, this mm -hmm. stuff grasps you mm -hmm. and um, grasp. Huh? I just said yeah, that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, yeah, I 25 percent of people, heroin users relapse after 15 years and i did not know that mm -hmm. it's incredible 25 yeah. percent, one in four after 15 years yeah so it never it never goes away right uh, right that that urge that craving is what has to be um is what you have to work on you know fighting every single day sure and i'm sure it gets less and less and less because i was a smoker for many years um but again, for everybody, it's different. Yeah. So, but yes, there is a huge relapse factor. And it's why recovery, recovery support sy systems are so important yeah. out there. Yeah. All right. So for the last 10 years, you've uh, been educating yourself. And do you want us to tell us a little bit about the Blairsville Support Group? So the Blairsville Support Group began in 2014 um, by two moms uh, one had uh, lost her son to an overdose, and the other mom had two sons that were struggling with substance use. And that group started, and strangely, I had worked with a gentleman by the name of Bill Hebenthal, who is a pastor now, and he, he's from Blairsville, but I ran into him at a um, an auction in Indiana, and he said, hey, Becky, because I worked with Bill at, at Rustic Lodge for many years. He was our chef for a while. And he said, hey, Becky, we just started this group down in Blairsville. Why don't you come down? And so I did. And that's, I mean, that's kind of, they, you know, reeled me in and I got involved. And um, we would bring speakers in. Um, it was about a year later that a gal that I had gone through a training with reached out to me and said, hey, we started this overdose vigil in, in Washington County. Would you come and speak for us? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So I am remember driving back from that going, oh, my gosh, we can do this. Mm -hmm. Indiana County can do this. We have yeah. to do this, you know. So we put one together, the first one together in, like, weeks. It was just a few weeks because International Overdose Awareness Day which started in Australia, strangely enough. <laughs> um, this, you know, it's it's an it overdoses worldwide. Um, is 
every August 31st. So we put this event together in a matter of, I don't know, like three or four weeks. But um, and so that still continues today. And we call it the annual Indiana County Overdose Awareness Candlelight okay. Vigil. And I actually do a video. We have speakers. We have vendors that come. Um, and it's not it's not really a remembrance event as much as it is to raise awareness. Right. Um, talking about the community, what's happening in the community, what, you know, what things are focused on educating and, and raising awareness, the use of Narcan. Um, we're now implementing harm reduction into that, into that, you know, the whole idea because harm reduction is keeping people well until they get, you know, can reach sobriety um, and keeping them healthy. Um, and then at the end, we do a video that's to music every year. I'm adding faces. That's, and that's yeah. unfortunate. It, it is. Yeah. Um, the first video, I just kind of put it out on Facebook and asked for, for you know, loved ones. Um, and so I got a lot from like kind of all over, not just Indiana. And so now that it's gaining more recognition, there's a lot more faces from Indiana County that are on there. Um, and surrounding areas as well, um, even Westmoreland and Armstrong. But I always change the music every year. I try to, you know, change it up so that it's not the same thing every year. Sure. Um, so this year will be our, I want to say it's our 10th, because we we didn't really have one in 2020, but I still did a video and shared it online. So even though we didn't ha actually have an event, it'll it'll be our 10th year. Um, and from that as well, um, the Blairsville Support Group purchases a license through the patented family um, drug prevention program called Reality Tour. And interestingly, the gal that um, developed this patent is from Butler, PA. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. So, it's the, the patent is Reality Tour. And it's designed to take you through the life of a teenager that's addicted to heroin. However, there's a lot more involved with that program than just the dramatic scenes that we do. The dramatic scenes are an arrest scene, a uh, jail cell scene, an overdose scene, and a funeral scene. But I like to, to classify those scenes as um, impactful and not traumatizing. Because they're very quick. Um, we have actors that, that carry out the scenes. But for the most part, the voice is a CD. You know, the actors aren't really talking. Okay. And the overdose scene is maybe 30 seconds. Okay. I mean, it, we show it and then it's, you know, close the curtain, it's done. Because um, we don't. There are a lot of people out there today that have lost loved ones. Yeah. One in three families either knows somebody or has a family member that is in the midst of or have lost somebody. So it's very prevalent. And um, so we, we try to be careful. In addition to those dramatic scenes, we have the district attorney comes and, and shares knowledge. Okay. Um, Jerry Overman, our coroner in Indiana County, um, I think he's missed one tour. I mean, he's just so dedicated to us. We're so thankful for him. Um, shares statistics, talks about um, a personal story of his own that has to do with um, substance use disorder. Um, and it wasn't, it was someone in his family that was affected by um, somebody else's um, actions. Okay. Right. And um, then we, we have a person in recovery that speaks. So it's, and, and then we have a PowerPoint that we share. Um, currently this year, um, it focuses on vaping because from what I understand, every school in Indiana County has a problem with vaping. I can imagine it, it has to because yep. people used to in the seventies, eighties, probably even nineties used to smoke cigs in the, mm -hmm. uh, in the bathroom, mm -hmm. but you could smell it. So there was, yes. you know, and you can't smell, you this. can't smell vaping. In fact, some of the vapes are little like zip drives. They look yeah. like zip drives. 
they're actually some schools that I know of are putting up like um, cameras or alarms or something, you know, that's that's helping to curtail that. But um, yeah, it's bad. Yeah. So the patent owner updates her curriculum every two to three years because the drug trends change. Just change every couple of years. Yeah. There's always something new. Yeah. It- so the program is designed specifically for families and kids ages 10 and up. And the idea is that you've got the family there. You're bridging the communication gap. You're giving both, both the youth and the adults information to take home and continue that conversation. Yeah. Right. We, we do a peer pressure scene that um, kind of teaches the kids a little bit about um, how they can say no. What are some um, ways that they can get out of a situation that they don't want to be in? How do they how do they utilize their parents in that situation? Yeah. Come up with a code word where, you know, you pick up the phone and say, did you say we were going out of town tomorrow? Yeah. And that's your code. Right. That's the parents code. To know something's wrong, you need to go get your kid. Okay. Right? So it's all about building those tools um, to make your toolkit um, more preventable. You know, all your all your t- um, skills, more prevention, more knowledge of what's out there. I-, I share statistics sometimes, and the parents' mouths will just go. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm like, it's here. It's here. It's here. It's here. And... You never know. First of all, you never know if you even or your loved one is going to be subjected to a situation where, you know, substances are put in front of them. But you also don't know how they're going to react, right? Some people have a different reaction to um, a substance than somebody else will. We're all different. So I, I use the um, example in at Reality Tour. You have two men that go into a bar and they both drink six beers. One might be happy and the other one might get mean and nasty. So everybody reacts differently. Another thing that I'll point out because um, a lot of people don't think of this. I went to visit my mom one time one summer and her husband was um, using an anti-anxiety depression med. Sure. And he was, I mean, he was old, like he was in his 90s. And she said, oh, yeah, some days he gets up and he doesn't feel good. So he takes three. (laughs) And the next day, if he feels okay, he doesn't take any. I said, Mom, that's not how those work. Yeah. You know, and so she's like, well, what do you mean? (laughs) No. (laughs) So even our older generation doesn't necessarily understand all of the complexity that you know is involved with medicine and the interactions and 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 stuff like that. I mean, she was he was actually prescribed tramadol and taking those regularly when they had just reclassified them as a, a pain medic. Okay, you know. So um, again, this knowledge at Reality Tour is it's just good knowledge to have under your belt. More importantly, for families to have under their belt, we also send home the families with a package of or a bag of resource information, local, you know, um, you know, drug and alcohol. I mean, there's so many there's so many organizations out there that have help and um, drug and alcohol commission, human services. There's so many. And if you don't know what's available, or how about this? You're embarrassed and ashamed because stigma is still, you know, thriving out there. Um, I was in those shoes. Don't be embarrassed about being embarrassed. It happens. Just yeah. deal, with, deal with it. Yeah. 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 And and I can remember saying to my boss, you know, I was just so distraught. And he said, Becky, do you think you're the only person that, that has a kid that uses heroin? Yeah. I said, that's it's my kid. It shouldn't happen. It's my kid. It's my kid. Yeah. He would never do that. You know, it's my kid. Um, so yeah, you, when it hits home, um, it, it's a crisis. It may never hit home and, and wonderful if it doesn't, but if it does, if you have even a little bit of knowledge under your belt, you're going to be that much more prepared to handle or at least feel comfortable while reaching out to somebody that can help you. Um, 
And then the other thing that we do at, with the Blairsville Support Group is we do two family education um, groups a month. One is at Reveal's Restaurant in Blairsville, and the other one is at Marion Center Presbyterian Church. Reveal's has good food, too. Oh, they do. It's fantastic. Oh, they do. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, and the owners are wonderful too. Good, that's Matt good. and Katie are awesome. Good. So, yeah. so what's the uh, next? What's what's next? What what's the next couple of years look like for you? So, I just turned sixty this month, and um, I started back to college. Good, good for you. I only had about fifteen credits under my belt for forty years, <laughs> and so I'm back there, um, and I'm working towards a degree in psychology with an emphasis on addiction. Good. What I see. A need for, and not just in Indiana County, everywhere, is the fact that people are so busy. I was one of these people. Um, you don't have time to educate yourself. You don't have time to, you know, take two hours out of your night or day to learn about addiction. Um, and that's not a good philosophy to have because our country, and I use this word, and, and I'm trying to make an impact. This country is infested with drugs. It's not getting any better. And we have to be proactive um, with our communities, with our families, with society to know what we're up against. Um, and again, a lot of people don't want to talk about it mm -hmm. because of stigma. Um, but that's what I want to focus on. You know, I'm already old. <laughs> So the older I you know, get, the younger sixty is. So don't worry. Oh well, yeah. and and again, you know, I, I I when I turn sixty, I'm like, wow, I'm sixty. You know, <laughs> you're just like, wow, how did that happen? On the other hand, you made it. Congratulations. You're right. Yeah, you know? you're right. Um, but I just I I'm driven by this passion to educate people, whether it's business owners, families, um, church you know, church administrators, whoever is willing to listen um, because we have to, we have to be prepared for this. Um, An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, really. And, and I think um, the world we live in today is so fast. Um, I myself used to live in a world where I wish 24 hours were 48 Mm -hmm. Because I had so much to do and I had so much more to do and I needed to get it done. And But stress also was, was a demise for me. Sure. Because it, it just really took, um, took me to a, a, bad, you know, bad place. Um, you can't overstress yourself. And today we're focused on better mental health and, and, and life and work balance. Um, and this is part of it, right? If you're raising a family, part of, I believe today, because I didn't do it you know, 20 years ago, is um, educating, educating myself about what's out there and, and what, you know, is going to confront my family at some point or another. Sure. Yeah. Well, good. Appreciate you doing this. Proud Appreciate of you for you all the stuff. Me. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, been, it's been good. Um, yeah. Well, so I'll put some links on there to the Blairsville Reality Tour. And uh, yeah, you're doing great work. Just just keep it up and keep working and we're, you're already making a difference. So I can't wait to see what this next handful of years is going to be like for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any, any final thoughts, anything you want to say? Just that. Um, yes. I'm, I'm glad you asked me that because I was thinking about this last night. I've shared this a couple times, but it really sits with me. I really believe now today, what I know about addiction had I been more knowledgeable and compassionate about what my son was struggling with, I think he would have left this world with a lot less shame. So, you know, to my Jake, I, I think he sits on my shoulder when I do these things. And, um, yeah, I think he, you know, he was such a good person, such a good-hearted person. And... Um, yeah, so that's why I do I what think, I do. I think looking down on you, he's very proud of what you're doing. I think he is, too. Mm -hmm. I think he is, too. And, and and honestly, Justin, that's one of the reasons I do it. You know, um, it's a memory. It's a memory of a beautiful human being 
who got caught up in something that a lot of people around him didn't understand. Yeah, it just you know, he, he just happened to to lose the war. That's all. And there's so many people out there mm-hmm. that are in this same fight, and um, you know, it's about understanding, probably mostly above anything else, that addiction is not a choice. It is no. not a choice, and if I can get people to realize that the science behind addiction is is so complex and um, it doesn't come down to just you know um, choosing to have a drink because a lot of us choose to have a drink yeah. right um, it but it's but it's who we are inside that's how that drink affects us and you know where it goes from there so um, yeah, that, that's probably the biggest thing because that's part of the huge stigma. Yeah. People think it's a choice. All right. All right, that's it, guys. Hopefully, we'll see you Thursday. This this should be out by a couple days before, but hopefully, we'll see you Thursday at the Mental Health Walk. But yeah. thank you, guys. Uh, love you guys, and uh, go outside. Yeah, it's beautiful. It thank is. you. Yeah.